and educators, helping to train them. Uh, I've worked with education ministries all the way down to kindergarten teachers, superintendents, principals, uh, librarians, the full range of teachers in between. And uh, I've demonstrated robotics to more than 18,000 students. And I've uh, spoken at conferences with about 20,000 educators, helped them understand the importance that robotics and artificial intelligence education and coding education is going to have in the future. And so what I like to do most in these presentations is to start with a little bit of background about how robotics and AI will be impacting the workforce because that sets a real precedent for what we need to be doing within education. And it, it's gonna kind of point to some things that we're not doing, that we should be doing, and maybe alter some practices and how we approach these things. So what I love to do at the beginning is to start with some um, statistics that are gonna sound really alarming. And then I'm gonna break down the statistics. And just before I get into all of this, some of the stuff at the beginning of this presentation might feel a little bit heavy uh, and sound like really bad news. And there's some parts of it that are heavy, but please bear with me because when we get to the end of the presentation, I have a very positive view of what the future is going to look like. I just think there are steps we need to take to get there. So the number one most startling statistic that I have is that forecasts show over the next 10 years, between 20 to 40% of jobs will be eliminated by robotics and artificial intelligence. And in Vietnam, that's going to equate to approximately 10 to 20 million people losing their employment. And it's important, you know, I know, I know that's a huge statistic, but it's important to understand the societal impact that this type of job loss can have <clears throat> if we don't have um, the children graduating from our schools prepared for the new jobs, because at the same time that we're gonna lose all of these jobs, we're going to have a lot of new jobs coming, but many of these new jobs will be high tech jobs and the people that are losing their jobs won't have the skills necessary to get these new jobs. So what I'd like to do is just run through some of the big industries, because if I say you know, 10, 10 to 20 million jobs are going away in the next decade, it's important to understand what that's going to look like and then the societal challenge that that can present and the economic challenge. So, I like to start with uh, the transportation industry because by now we've all heard of self-driving vehicles. And once we have self-driving vehicles, uh, what does the future look like for bus drivers, truck drivers, and cab drivers? So those three careers are kind of on the chopping block a little bit as we look forward another five years or so. And there's already, these vehicles are already being used around the world. Uh, in, in my home province, uh, we have a very large fleet of self-driving trucks that are being used uh, in the oil industry, oil and gas industry. In Australia, they're using them in the mines. In Northern Europe, there are self-driving buses on the roads. Uh, we've actually got one in my home city as well. It only goes a few blocks right now and it goes kind of slowly, but there's no driver and there's no tracks. So this technology now is coming and it's only a matter of time before it gets into the marketplace. And as soon as it starts to present a positive economic benefit, we're going to start to see companies adopting this very, very quickly. So as soon as it proves safe and there's economic benefit, it will come in very quick. So what happens when a bus driver or a truck driver or a cab driver loses their job? Now, most people, most adults, are very busy during the day working. And then in the evenings, they're with their children or their family. They're getting together with friends, coaching sporting events, whatever that might look like. A significant percentage of us don't improve our skills on a nightly basis. So we, it's fair, because of that, it's fair to assume people in the transportation industry also don't do that. So what happens when a, a bus driver loses their job? they don't have the skills needed to get all of these new high tech jobs that are coming. So then we start to look at what kind of a job could a bus driver get? What kind of skills do they have? And what we start to do often is go, okay, maybe they could get a job in retail, for example. But the challenge that we're going to see over the next decade is retail, brick and mortar retail, 
the stores you walk into to get your goods, that industry is also contracting and shrinking. Online retail is going very strong, right? But now retail jobs are big data analysis, search engine optimization, warehouse robots, drones, self-driving vehicles, you know, uh, supply chain management. Those are retail jobs. The days of retail jobs where people are standing in a store, you know, taking your cash and checking you out, those days are coming to a close, or at least they're greatly diminishing. So the retail industry can't absorb the transportation industry because the retail industry is also contracting. So now where can those two industries find employment? Well, maybe they can go into hospitality. But unfortunately, if you've been in a McDonald's recently, you know there's touchscreen ordering. And that used to be at the restaurant near me, four or five people across the front counter, but now it's one. They go two shifts a day. There used to be 10 people needed. Now there's two. In North America, where I'm located, that represents seven people per day, 15,000 restaurants across the continent, uh, 105,000 jobs that were eliminated like that. No headlines, just less jobs. And so, you know, and we've got uh, robotic chefs coming. There's apparently a restaurant in China that is completely run by robots, including the, the shipping and receiving. So we're starting to see this technology coming more, robotic coffee shops. So the hospitality industry can't absorb retail and transportation because hospitality is also going to be contracting, right? And it, we can look at some other industries, agriculture, there's technology in there. And I know that Vietnam is huge in agriculture and forestry. And then we look at uh, an industry like manufacturing. But a few years ago, the CEO of Foxconn in, in China said that his goal was to eliminate a significant percentage of his staff with technology, with robotics. And so what we know is even in the manufacturing sector where people are not heavily paid, those jobs are being replaced by technology. So we're going to see a significant pool of unemployment. And there's a really important distinction to understand here. This is not temporary job loss. This is not, I lost my job, I'll go get another job in the same industry. If the transportation industry is shrinking and you lose your job as a truck driver and they're self-driving trucks, it's very hard to find a new job as a truck driver. So we're going to see millions of people having to retrain. Now, one of the big challenges that we face is at the, you know, at the, uh, at the schooling that we're currently offering, a significant portion of our kids only have enough skill to take the exact type of jobs that are disappearing. And there's another important distinction to understand. It's not just about the tens of millions of jobs going away, the tens of millions of new jobs. It's about the jobs in between as well, the jobs that remain, but that will be transformed by this technology. And a great example of that is teaching. For many teachers, uh, teaching is not a high-tech career. But if we look at the changes that are coming societally, if you have students in your schools that want to be teachers, they need to understand this technology because the skill gap is in high-tech jobs. So the kind of teachers that are going to be getting hired in the next five to 10 years are teachers who can teach high-tech skills. 3D printing, robotics, coding, artificial intelligence. Those are the teachers that are going to be in the highest demand. And for each of you that are listening, if you want to make sure that your job security is there, learning this technology is a great way to ensure that you're always employed, right? Now imagine what happens in five years time, a whole bunch of teachers come out of university looking for jobs. Some of them have high tech skills and some don't. Who's getting the jobs first? The people with the high tech skills, because that's where the skill gap is. And I want to give another example that's a little bit surprising. Um, and I know this, is, this information is accurate because I, 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 I got this information when I was doing a keynote presentation at a robotics conference about six years ago. So I was talking to a whole bunch of roboticists, engineers. I gave my keynote presentation and after I was done, 
I was approached by over the next two days, 20 or 25 people from the fashion industry. And I, the first couple, I thought they must just have a personal interest in robotics. But after you meet you know, three or four people in an hour, you go, wait a second, there's a pattern here. So I started to say to them, you're the, you know, you're the fifth person I've met in an hour from the fashion industry at a robotics conference. Why are there so many of you here? And what they all told me was, if you want to get a job in fashion, two of the most important skills are 3D printing and robotics. And to be clear, all of them put 3D printing first, but they all said 3D printing and robotics. This is six years ago. And now what, imagine what happens in our schools if a student comes to us and says, I'm interested in going into fashion design. We think of fashion design as being over here and being very creative. And what skills would you need? You have to be good at drawing. You have to be good at with colors, have good resilience because you're probably gonna take some criticism about your designs. You'd have to be innovative and creative, maybe so well. And we would think that robotics and coding and 3D printing are at the other end of the spectrum, but they're not anymore. Now they're like this. We have to understand that robotics and artificial intelligence Yes, they are industries, but much like a computer, they are going to be a layer across all industries almost immediately. It took computers a long time to go from being a silo industry to being a layer across all industries. It will not take robotics and artificial intelligence as long. It took computers about 30 years. Robotics and AI will do it in about five to 10 years. And the reason is, it, the reason it took computers so long is we had to shrink a mainframe from the size of a school gymnasium all the way down to fitting in our pockets. The hard work has been done. Robotics and artificial intelligence will be unleashed on, on industry after industry as quickly as engineers can create the new technology to bring enhanced productivity and enhanced you know, functionality, versatility, all of these things. And I, again, I want to just take a moment to say, I believe the future is going to look great, but I do believe that we also have a challenge coming with this job loss. And it really points to the fact that we have to change the way we're educating our kids. And one of the challenges that we see a lot in education is most students are not learning these new world skills to a very high level. Do they need to be better thinkers? Yes. Problem solvers, yes. Creative, yes. All of those things are very important. But if they have a level of these digital technologies and skills on top of that, that gives people a significant advantage. So let's go back to the fashion design example, because I want to make this very clear. Let's say this circle represents all the fashion that has ever been made in the world. It's all inside this circle. If we add 3D printing and robotics, the circle gets bigger. I'm not sure if it's 20% bigger, 50%, 100%, but it's bigger. And so I will ask you this question. If you owned a fashion design company, do you hire the person that gives you this potential or this potential? You want the innovative designs and all the cost savings in manufacturing, who do you hire? And the answer is easy, it's this person. So what we have to understand is as soon as this person becomes available, this person stops getting hired. And that's a really important distinction because we have to understand that the next 10 years are going to be very competitive. They're going to be competitive from country to country, province to province, city to city, community to community. You know, if, if you understand that these changes are coming and we accept that as true, what happens if China gets into this technology in a big way and Vietnam doesn't? Where is all the new opportunity going? The, the, the job loss will come for all countries. The new opportunities, it, it, both in terms of new opportunities and the enhanced opportunities, those will come to the regions where the people have the highest level of intellectual infrastructure. And that's true from city to city and from community to community. If you have a large city, 
and one school district or one region is teaching robotics and coding to all of their students and the other region isn't, all of the people in the area getting hired are going to be from this one region. That region will have economic prosperity in the future. The other region won't. So it's really critical that all of our kids get this education. And now, now that we have that base understanding, I want to explain how things are going right now in education. And I can't say for sure this is true uh, in Vietnam, but it has been true in every country that I've talked to so far. So I want to draw something here for you. This is my bell curve of engineering mindedness. The most engineering minded students are over here. The students that dislike engineering are over here. The people that like music and art, uh, you know, and drama, acting, they're over on the left side of this curve. Most of the kids are somewhere in the middle. And over here on the right side is the kids that love engineering and physics. Now at the high school level, the way we teach robotics, well, the way everybody else teaches robotics currently, the average level of engagement is 3% of boys, 0.3% of girls. Three girls out of 1,000, 30 boys out of 1,000. So in a school of 2,000 children, and again, I'm not, I can't say for sure how these statistics play out in your particular schools in Vietnam, but these are the statistics that are from North America. They've held true in Australia. They're true in most countries. 3% of boys, 0.3% of girls at the high school level or secondary school level. But now imagine the in five years time, the, what we've described the future is going to look like and how everybody that has this technology and this understanding has an advantage Three girls out of a thousand, three boys out of 30 boys out of a thousand. It's a huge problem. The way we teach robotics, we can consistently get 25% to 45%. We can go from three girls to 250 girls, and we can teach schools to do that overnight every time. The strategies we've used have been tested with 18,000 children across all socioeconomic. Uh, backgrounds from, you know, really Im impoverished areas to areas where the children are come from, from wealth uh, across different countries, different uh, races, both boys and girls, it's there, it's there across the board. At the middle school level, so when I say middle school, just in case we have terminology differences, I'm talking about children that are uh, 12 to 14 or 15 years old. The way everybody else is teaching robotics, they will average 5% to 15% of students. Depending on what the product is, the girl engagement is also lower at this, at this age group. Uh, but again, we're only getting the most engineering minded kids, right? Now, when we demonstrate robotics the way that we teach it, we can get consistently 90% of all students to want to learn robotics. This is game changing when we contemplate what percentage of our kids need this education. <clears throat> and it's important to understand that if we graduate children that don't have this high tech education, they're competing with all of these unemployed people. We need all of our kids to be able to take these new jobs and create new inventions and new opportunities to help employ those people that have lost their employment, right? In, in countries that do this and regions that do this, they will have prosperity and they will have a great future. The ones that don't will have a challenge. And a lot of countries in the world now are talking about universal basic income, but it's important to understand that like a universal basic income is, is going to theoretically pay, give, every, give all citizens of a country enough money to survive. But that money has to come from somewhere. And if a country already has high unemployment, they have less people paying taxes. They have less companies doing well paying taxes. But if the company, if the country has a lot of people making new opportunities in this high tech world, they can pay a lot of taxes that can help support people. 
the social implications of this are enormous. Now, there's another important thing to understand. Again, the way we're teaching robotics right now, we teach it like an engineering course. So we only attract the engineering minded kids. But when I was going through the careers of the people whose jobs were most in jeopardy, they come from this side of the bell curve. These are the kids that need this education the most from a societal perspective. These are the kids that are gonna have the hardest time finding employment in five to 10 years. So it's critically important that we find a way to reach them. And again, we've been able to, at the, at the elementary school level, we get 98% of kids wanting to learn robotics. And a lot of times when I tell educators the kind of percentage of, of engagement that we can get, they come back thinking that that's not possible. So I end up having to go into their schools and show them with their students. And that's why I've demonstrated to 18,000 kids because we know these strategies work and we like to show them to people that it works with their kids. And then they're like, well, of course, you know, everybody thinks that we can't get these levels till they see how we do it. And then everybody says, well, of course people wanna learn robotics like that. So what I'd like to do is to just use about a half an hour here, 20, 25 minutes to talk about how we present robotics and the difference between what everybody else does and what we do, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take my little robot here. This is JD. JD is an easy robot. Whenever I'm demonstrating robotics, I always use a humanoid because it engages the largest percentage of students. I'm just gonna turn them on. It's gonna hide a window here. I'm gonna to connect to the robot. We connect to it with Wi-Fi. So it's possible he may misbehave a little bit, but he'll probably do a great job. And just while I'm connecting the robot, I just wanna say if there are people here from, uh, that are watching this from international schools or private schools, we have strategies that we employ with private schools that can help schools put in robotics programs that will draw significantly more interest in terms of new, new students. So what we found is we can work with these schools and put robotics in, and it actually becomes, a, you know, more, the school becomes more profitable because they've added robotics. Now, my goal is to work with all schools, to work with ministries of education, to help them understand what's coming and to build, you know, to build successful models for all children, because I really think all kids need this. And it's interesting, you know, within North America, a trend that we're seeing is uh, there will be STEM magnet schools. So they'll say, okay, within this school, we're going to teach really strong STEM education and all the kids from the surrounding areas that are interested can bust to this school and get this really great STEM education. The problem is that attracts all of these kids. And again, it's these kids, you know, the, the idea of a STEM magnet school means that other schools are not doing really strong STEM education and everybody needs to do it. Okay, so I've got, I've got this guy here. I'm just going to connect to him. Okay, so what I do when I'm going into schools to get a really high level of engagement is I do one-hour presentations. And in one hour, I can get virtually all the children that are watching the presentation interested in learning to robotics and coding. The way that I do that is a little bit different for elementary schools and middle schools versus high schools. Again, in case there's a... A, a, a wording difference. High schools would be 16 to 18 year old students. Uh, same thing with university kids. Uh, at, the, at the high school level, I give a lot of, I give the same information I'm giving to you because high school kids don't have much runway. They need this education today because they're running out of time to get it. It's going to be very, very expensive for the people who have lost their jobs or the people that graduate without this education to try to get this education after they're out of school. While people are in school, the cost of the education, if, you're, if you were to buy a, a classroom set of robots and teach robotics, you can, with a classroom set, you can teach to about 200 students a year. And over five years, the cost is about $10 per student. So we can give these kids this really great education that they all need, 
for $10 a student if we do it within our schools. But if we wait till after the, the kids are out of school, the cost is dramatically higher at a time when people are having a hard time finding a job and can't afford it. We really have to get this education to kids at school. Anyway, back to my presentation. Um, if I'm talking to middle school, so let's say 15 years old down to kindergarten, I don't talk about any of the job loss and stuff. I just talk about all the cool ways that robotics is going to change the world and how if you're interested in being a policeman or a firefighter or, you know, uh, a, even a professional athlete is going to involve technology, environmental cleanup, agriculture. Um, oh, it's, 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 it's honestly everything. Teaching, I mentioned earlier, fashion design. I'll run through a big list of careers, space exploration, medicine. I'll run through a big list of careers. So no matter what the children think they might do in the future, that they understand this has some relevance for them. And then I'll say to them, okay, we've got 45 minutes left. I can tell you more about robotics, or if you want, I can show you what this robot can do because he's been standing there the whole time. And I know everybody wants to see what he can do. So then everybody says they want to see the robot. So I very uh, casually or subtly activate the speech recognition. And I'll say this, JD, show me how strong you are. In this moment, you know the sound when all of the kids are rustling around in their seats and you can hear the seats moving on the floor, the desks are jostling. That's the sound I hear because now all of the kids are like, wait a second, that robot understood him. So then I'll say this, JD, what else can you do? Now, I programmed each of these in about 20 minutes, and I'm not a programmer. If I could do that in 20 minutes, each of you could do that in 20 minutes, and so could your students from 10 years old up. It might take the 10-year-old half hour or 45 minutes, but they can still do those types of actions. I've had high school students program this robot to do a somersault in one hour, which is crazy to get like the program a humanoid robot to do a somersault in an hour, having never seen the software before is amazing. Um, if I'm dealing with young children, I'll be kind of fun with them and play with them a little bit. And I'll say, you know, JD is a very young robot. He's not really sure what he is. So let's ask him a couple questions, see if he knows what he is. JD, are you a bird? Okay, so you can hear that you can upload your favorite songs into the robot, make the robot do customized choreography and dances, which is going to appeal very heavily to the kids over on this side of the, of the, of the engineering curve. The non-engineering minded kids are like, hey, I can program a dance, that's pretty cool. Um, I actually did an interview with somebody that was an Australian writer a few years back, and he asked me, could your robot perform a soliloquy from Hamlet? You know, the to be or not to be. And I said, sure. And I explained to him how the robot could do that. And he said, could your robot act in a scene opposite a person? And I said, sure. And I explained how the robot could do that with speech recognition and, and stuff. And then he said, could two robots act in a scene opposite each other? And I said, yeah. And I said, you're asking very specific questions. What are you angling toward? And he said, I'm trying to find a way to give my STEM students more humanities and to give my humanity students and my art students more STEM. And I loved what he said because that's the exact approach we need to take. We need to try to infuse STEM into all of our subject areas. And we're, when we're teaching robotics, we're teaching coding and critical thinking, math, physics, the arts can be in there because you can use these robots to create whatever you want. You know, you can take them apart and you can build them. This one's a humanoid, but you can put it into a different shape. Um, here's something that was programmed by an eight-year-old girl. JD, can you sing happy birthday? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. 
Okay, an eight-year-old girl programmed that. But this platform is so powerful that you can make life-sized humanoids. I'm told NASA uses it for rapid prototyping. It's an incredibly powerful real-world platform that children as young as eight can work with. Now, I guess for a point of clarification, um, I don't advocate a classroom of eight-year-olds using this unless they've already had a good level of computer literacy and technological knowledge because the, the children can learn this at eight, it's not a problem, but classroom management of 30 children learning robotics at the age of eight can be challenging. So anyways, going back to my presentation to the kids, they're all just super excited about what they've seen. They're saying, can the robot dance? Can the robot do the floss? Can it do a, a dab? Like it's just all the things that are in their head that they'd love to see this robot do, they start blurting it out. And I'll say the robot can do all of those things, if you program him in, you program those things into the robot. Now he can do a dance. And if we have time at the end of the presentation, I'll show you all the robot dancing. And so then I say, okay, now we got 40 minutes left. Who would like to come up and program this robot? And at the high school level, students are usually pretty reluctant to be the first person to come up to program it because they don't want to fail in front of their friends and classmates but I can usually get one up pretty easily. And then they start to come up more easily after the first one. At the middle school level, 15 years old and below, the kids are very excited about programming this robot. So what I do is I have the, I have the software on a screen behind me with a projector or a smart board set up. And then I say, okay, I get, I get one volunteer up and they program this robot to wave. And that takes about three minutes. If I've got time at the end, I can show you how fast and easy it is. But just trust me, it's real fast and everybody can do it. The way we program the robot to do movements, imagine I was a robot and I was gonna wave. We, we say, okay, deconstruct this action, go slow, what does it look like? I put my hand up, then I pivoted and went out, then I pivoted and came back. So really we have one, two, three pivot points we call those frames, we make those frames, and then we string the frames together in an action, right? It's super fast and easy. So after three minutes, the student has programmed the robot to wave, and I give him a big hand or her a big hand, and I'm like, when you get home and your parents ask you how your day was, you say, I am totally awesome, I programmed a robot. So now the class is all excited because they've seen how easy it is. And this is a critically important thing that we're doing. If we want to get this level of engagement, it takes three things. We have to let the kids know it's important to them and it's relevant for their future. I'll tell the kids, if you understand how to do robotics and coding, you'll make 40 or $50,000 more. If you wanna have a nice car, this will get you a nice car, right? If you wanna have a nice house, this will get you a nice house. And so I want them to understand it's relevant. It's gonna make your life as an adult really fun. You're gonna do the things you wanna do and do important things. The second thing is we have to let them know it's fun and inspiring. It's not enough that it's relevant, we have to inspire them. We've taken care of that with the robot listening to my voice. The kids are super excited about going and learning robotics, but we still won't get these kind of numbers unless we deprogram their fear. Now, a lot of kids, when they think of robotics, they think of big mechanical robots and stuff. So this doesn't look like that. This looks like a fun toy to play with, right? So what I do is after the one student has come up and programmed the robot to wave, is I will say to all of the students, who here could have done that? Put your hand in the air if you could have programmed this robot to wave. You all saw how easy it was. So all the kids put their hand up. And I want them to acknowledge that they can do this. And I will do that after every single step of this demonstration. I'll say, who could have done that? Who could have done that? And they put their hands up all the way. So at the end of the presentation, I'll say, so you all could have done everything we've done here today, right? And everybody will say yes. Now, what I, I'll just tell you the things that the kids will do in 45 minutes, a class of 10 year olds can program this robot to wave, to talk while waving, then they'll record their own voice into the computer and have it come out the robot the same way as when the robot was singing happy birthday. That was the girl's voice. <clears throat> they will give the robot a new name 
and have it respond to their voice. So they'll give it a verbal command, they'll program this in, then they'll talk to the robot and it will respond, which is mind blowing for the kids. And there's something else I do in this step that is really important. One student is up here trying to figure out what to call the robot, but I want all the students to imagine that this is their robot. I wanna build an emotional connection with this robot. So I tell them, if you guys have a name for this robot, if this was your robot, what would its name be? Go ahead, just blurt it out, just say it. And they all start yelling out different names. A lot of them are crazy and stuff, but they're all putting their own personality into that name. Right. And now the big thing is only one name is going to get chosen by the volunteer. And so then 59 other people in the audience will go, oh, I totally would have called that robot Swagbot. And he would have been the coolest robot ever. And I would have made him dance like this, whatever is in their mind. They're disappointed that that's not what's happening. So at the end of the class, when I say who wants to learn robotics, I do. Why? because I wanna make Swagbot do cool things, right? So now we've got them inspired. They're seeing how easy it is. So we're building their confidence and they know it's relevant. We've got all three of those needed factors to get massive engagement. And I've never seen another subject, not even phys ed, that gets 90% of kids to want to learn it, right? And if this works for kids that are, um, academically inclined and not academically inclined. Boys and girls, the kids that don't pay attention in class. I've taught robotics programs to kids. I did a week long program, this was awesome, to a group of 15 boys from grade seven to 12, where they were gonna learn nothing but robotics for a week straight. And there were no girls, because again, you know, they said, who wants to take a robotics program? And the girls said, no, thank you. But every girl that came into the library while we were teaching this stopped and watched for five or 10 minutes. So I'd walk over and say, would you like to learn robotics? Like, would you like to program that robot? And they're all saying, yeah, like, of course they would. Like that was kind of the, the tone of voice that they had. And so we know that we can get the girls, but in this group, I had only boys. At the end of the second day, I said to the supervising teacher, I am blown away by your students. It has been 14 straight hours of, of school time learning robotics, which is, which is a lot of learning. Your students are still laser focused. And the supervisor said, you don't even know the half of it. These are the students that are failing or are nearly failing. The ones that don't bother showing up for school, and if they come to class, they'll insult the teacher and walk out halfway through. Those are the kids you have here. And I didn't tell you that because I was afraid you wouldn't show up. And I was so glad he didn't tell me that because I came in with no preconceived notion about these students. And what I saw was incredible engagement and I saw incredible results. At the end of this week of learning, they did a focus group an independent focus group with these students and asked them if we did another experiential learning week, what would you like us to teach? 14 out of those 15 boys said robotics and one boy said rocketry. Those are the kids that were at risk because this was a small town that I was doing this in, a farming community, uh, mining in the area. So these children, a significant percentage of the ones like the kids that I was teaching would drop out of school and just go to work at the age of you know, 16 or 17 and really then get replaced by technology and not have much future. And they were so hungry for this. I have heard from countless schools, you've changed the culture of our school. Everybody is buzzing about robotics and coding, even the teachers, even the teachers that don't like those things when they see how easy it is to do this. And so I'm not gonna probably have a lot of time. I'm down to 18 minutes probably not gonna have a lot of time to show you how the software works today, but you can all contact me uh, through the, the Whova app and I would be happy to arrange a private demonstration for you to show you how this works, how we can help your school bring this education to kids. Okay, back to my presentation. I, I've told you we get the kids to wave, to get the robot to wave, to talk, they record their voice, it comes out the robot, 
they name the robot and are communicating with it verbally. Every one of our robots has a camera built in. They've got the robot tracking colors. So the robot's moving its head, tracking the color, recognizing an object. That object is a student's face and the robot will greet that student by name. And if we have time, they can program the robot to respond to a Wii remote where they lift their arm and the robot will lift its arm. So the robot is mirroring what the people are doing. They're doing kinesthetic, you know, robotic control. You can also use virtual reality glasses. So you see what the robot sees, you move your head, the robot moves its head. So those are some of the things that we can get the kids to do in that one hour presentation. Now, at the end of it, I'll say, remember I say, you know, who here could have programmed everything that we've seen? And all of the kids will tell me they could all do it. Then I will show them, I'm going to just share my screen with you. Bear with me for one second. Okay, share. Now, hopefully, it's telling me you're all seeing my screen. Hopefully, that's the case. I'll say, I'll say to the kids, okay, I want you all to watch this video. And hopefully, the sound will come through. It usually does. Yes, Miss. What can I get from you? White wine, please. Come and write it up. Yes. How was your day, Miss? Pretty good, thanks. I'm just going to fast forward this a little bit to speed things so, along. I want you to see the robot use its hands. Gloss, please, Miss. Of course. Thank you, Miss. You're welcome. All right, that'll do for this. I will stop my screen share now. Okay. So I'll say to the kids, all of you said you can program this robot. You know, and they've just seen the robot on a big screen behind me. So they, they understand the scale of this robot. I'll say, you all said you can program this. Who thinks they could program this big robot? And at the elementary school level, you know, uh, eight-year-olds to 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, sometimes some of them will think it because they're still fearless, which is awesome. At the middle school level and at the high school level, almost nobody thinks they can program that big robot. So then I will say this to the kids. This big robot uses the exact same hardware and software as this little robot. If you can program this, you can program that today. It's not that you could learn those skills someday. What you have just showed me is the exact same way you would program this big robot. And in that moment, it, you can just see the kids, like you can just see their brains processing because we've just changed how they view themselves and their future. All of a sudden, all of them think I can do anything. If you know that you can program that life-sized robot and you're in fifth grade or seventh grade or ninth grade or 10th grade, how does that change your future education? How does that change the careers you're going to go into, right? It's it just what I love most about what I get to do and what we do with this robot and the, this robotics platform is we're teaching robotics and we're teaching coding but the number one thing that we're doing is we're changing how children view themselves. We're giving the kids on this side of the spectrum that think they can't a whole new view of what their future can look like. And it's really so, it's so empowering and important that we do this. And that's how we're able to get these numbers. These kids won't, like these kids won't take robotics at high school because they're afraid they don't know how to do it. The barrier to entry is high, it looks mechanical. A lot of times what's happening in high school and, it, 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 and sometimes in middle schools, we're teaching robotics like an engineering course. So we all know that computer literacy is critically important and robotics and AI literacy will also be important. And just to be clear, I am not advocating that everybody needs to be a roboticist or a programmer. But if you have that literacy, your opportunities for the future become much greater. Now imagine, let's go back to the computer for a second. And imagine if we know everybody needs computer literacy, 
But the way we start teaching about computers is to say, okay, everybody, welcome to the computer class. I want you all to take out your screwdrivers, take the backs off of your computers. We're gonna see how computers are made and then we're gonna make a circuit board. We're all gonna make a computer in this class. And what I can tell you is nobody cares about that except for the top two or 3% of kids. The top two or 3% of kids go, this is the best class ever. But the majority of kids would not. Right? We don't start teaching about computers that way. So why are we teaching robotics that way? Why are we teaching coding and artificial intelligence that way? We have, to, we have to make that bottom rung of the ladder much lower. And I like this platform because the bottom rung of the ladder is so easy that an eight-year-old can program it, but it's so powerful that you can build life-sized humanoid robots and self-balancing boards and rovers and submarines. You can do anything with it. You can build robots that have methane gas sensors, you know, uh, inverted pendulum, accelerometers, gyroscope, ultrasonic, LIDAR, which is the same technology they use for self-driving cars. You can use all of those with this platform. There's no, there's no upper limit. So when we get the kids this confidence at a young age, it changes their trajectory. And they start to learn all of the math skills involved. They build very strong visual spatial skills, the way we program these robots. And I work with somebody locally that has a double doctorate in math education and learning environment. And she uses this robot when she's tutoring students that are visually spatially impaired, right? And, and what she says is strong visual spatial skills is the base for math. It's the foundation for math. If you can visualize with your mind, the math comes easy. And so she says, after a week, the difference is night and day. And I just want to explain a reason why. Like we work with angles, right? So if I, imagine I'm a robot again, and I'm going to put my arm to a 45 degree angle. I've moved this servo to a 45 degree angle. They would go, oh, that's what a 45 degree angle looks like. Well, that's what a 90 degree angle looks like. If they have a test where they're trying to do math, and it's like, which of these is a 90 degree angle? That's pretty easy. 135. What's the supplementary angle for 135? I think this is supplementary. It might be complementary. I think it's supplementary. 135 and 45. That equals 180, right? Because one side of the robot works in, you know, works from zero to 180, and the other side works from 180 to zero because the servos are a mirror image on this guy. On the on the spider robot we have, it's different. On the robot, on the rover, it's a little bit different as well. But for this guy, it's mirror images. But I want you to see something else as well. If I move this servo to a 45 degree angle, what happens if the robot pivots its servo in its chest? This is a 45 degree angle, so is this, and so is this on a rotating axis. So the kids start to be able to visualize things really strong in three dimensions, right? And so, and that just changes the way they view everything. So we can get the kids such powerful math skills with just this, and you can do cosine, sine, and tangent. You can program these robots with Scratch, Blockly, Python, JavaScript, C++, right? We can bring kids in at every level and take them to the highest level. We're coming out with a new curriculum in the next 30 days that is a artificial intelligence curriculum to help kids understand what artificial intelligence is and what it isn't. Uh, and these robots can all plug into Microsoft's cognitive services. So kids can be using Microsoft's AI engine when they're working with these little toy robots. They can also do that with the big robots, right? So the nice thing I also like about this is when you're learning robotics, it's almost like learning a new language, right? If you have a school that goes from grade seven to grade 12, all of those students can be using the same robot. Right? If you're getting a kit that is like Lego or VEX or something like that, some students are using it. Once they start using that kit, nobody else can use it because they're making a custom robot. But with this, a student can use this from eight to nine o'clock. From nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, you're recharging the battery. From 10 to 11, a different student uses it. Then it charges over lunchtime. From one to two, a different student uses it or, two, or, or a different group of students. So you can get a lot more students using the same product by using something that comes in a pre-built shape. I'm also a big fan of not starting with the kids needing to necessarily do a lot of building and spend a lot of time building. There's this much to learn in robotics. Building is a small percentage of it. Some kids love it, some kids don't. 
but there's all this to learn. So what I like to do is not, I don't like to put the design thinking at the same time as I'm putting the coding education and the robotics education, because there's no anchors for the kids. It's harder for them to learn all three at the same time. So I like to start with one of, you know, one of the pre-built shapes so the kids can go, okay, I can see I'm dealing with a humanoid. Now I can just learn robotics and coding. And then once they have that understanding, they can take it apart and build something different, right? You could take this guy's head off here and put that over here on his arm and stuff. And, you know, one of the other neat things you can do with this, because they've got built-in cameras, is you can run robotics programs the same way, for example, NASA does. When we do robotics, we always have the robot right in front of us, but that's not how robotics is in the real world most of the time. Because you have your robot going into a volcano, going into space, going into a person's body or whatever in the future. And, and so what you actually have, if you're a roboticist or you know, a robot operator in the future, is you have your computer screen, you have your camera, you have your statistical readout and analysis and data. So what I love to do when I'm teaching robotics with this guy is I'll let the kids program it to go, you know, this is your Mars rover, program it, it's going to go pick up the mineral sample and put it in the back. And I'm like, okay, you've got that, you understand it now. And then I go put it in a different room and I'm like, now do it. And all you get is this. And what they realize is maybe this isn't the best place for the camera. Maybe the camera should be down here. And now they start to get design thinking and problem solving. So there's so, much, there's so many lessons that we can teach, but I like to start with pre-designed robots because the kids, are, the kids need some anchor points because what they're learning is so, is so new. So we can do this and give them smaller points to click up and move up the ladder. Okay, so uh, I'm, you know, I would be so happy to talk with any of you. If you, th if you found this presentation to be interesting, I would be happy to do this presentation at your school for your other colleagues. Or if, you know, if you're a principal for your staff, um, if you're a reseller, I'd be happy to talk to you about the possibility of selling these robots in Vietnam. You can buy them from us directly for the time being, but eventually we'll have a reseller there. So we'll be working that way. You know, I would like to be, I, I would be interested in talking to the Ministry of Education. I can help them to understand these changes that are coming and what we can do to build a comprehensive robotics program from kindergarten all the way up through university to scaffold the kids all the way through. And we can do that with individual schools, private schools and international schools. We can show you how to attract more kids using this kind of a presentation and with these robots. And I've worked with schools that have had, you know, 5% of their students learning robotics, or sorry, learning coding. And then they brought these robots in to, to help teach coding. They did an open house for new inbound students. And the level, the, the number of kids that wanted to learn programming and take the computer science class went from 5% to 45% in, you know, in one month, right, over, over the school flip over. All the new inbound kids were so excited about it. I guess 45% were, but that's way better than 5%, right? So there's a lot that we can do together. We're happy to work with everybody. The truth is, it, you know, I'm not even so concerned about whether you buy things from me. I'm just trying to help share this information because it's so important. It's so important that we understand this and get some strategies to kids to try and help them get this education. I've only got a couple minutes left. I can see I've got three questions in the chat or three comments in the chat. So I'm gonna look at this. If, I, if you have questions that come up afterwards, please reach out through the, the Whova app and I'm happy to answer your questions moving forward. Um, okay, can an individual get the program and training? When we sell robots to, uh, to educators, we always provide training for free. You know, so with, if you buy one robot, you'll get a couple of hours. If you buy a classroom set, which is 15 robots, you'll get six hours. Most of our educators don't need more than a couple hours because the software is so easy to use. If you can get 10 year olds to do it, everybody can do it. We have curriculum that is self-directed, so you don't have to be a roboticist or a programmer to be able to have success. It, so we, we've really come up with a solution that anybody can teach. We provide the training, so it's really a turnkey solution for any school to be able to start offering world-class robotics. Okay, then the next comment there is just very interesting. Um, in what time period will a regular teacher be able to learn the basics? 
within a couple of hours, you'll be able to make the robot wave and stuff. And remember in 45 minutes, what I explained, we could get the kids to do. So really it's just a question of orienting with the software. And then there's 75 free tutorial videos and projects on the website. So there's a lot of material that you can learn and go through if you're teaching a class and you're not sure how to do something, there's gonna be a tutorial on that. But the curriculum is self-directed. Our curriculum was written by a social studies curriculum writer. And we chose that person for two reasons. Reason number one, I wanted to have strong morals in our curriculum, right? I, I'm not interested just in making world-class roboticists. We can do that with this platform. I'm interested in producing world-class roboticists and a society of people that understand robotics and artificial intelligence and the morals behind it, right? So we can start making strong decisions for humanity for the future. Uh, and then the second reason was I wanted a social studies curriculum writer because I wanted somebody that had no technical knowledge. So we trained them and then they went, okay, I know nothing about this. What's the important first step? What's the next step? So they've built a really great system of being able to scaffold teachers and students up to full knowledge. Uh, will this help differently abled learners? So the, the, yeah, it's, it's so great. It's hands-on, it's visual. What, like if I'm gonna get the robot to wave, if I'm moving the angle of the servo, the robot's responding in real time. So the kids are, the kids are able to do so much. For children that have, um, you know, if they're audibly impaired or whatnot, then there's so much visual that you can do with this. We're working with a university in Australia and with a group in Italy on autism you know, to work with the robots with, to do with autism. Uh, and, and one of the people there is the person that was responsible for, uh, or at least instrumental in creating the now robots autism features or, or, or programming. Uh, and the now robots cost $10,000 US for one robot. You can get 15 of these for $9,000, which includes curriculum and training. That's a classroom set. This guy cost 550 US in case anybody is curious about that. Uh, any other questions? I'm now exactly at time. Um, and I don't want to keep you guys because I know there's a lot of great sessions. But I do want to thank you all so much for attending. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me on the app. I would love to talk to you more. And if you have any more questions, I'll be on the app for a little bit more tonight and I can answer those for you. Thank you so much.